What's up, Matrix? Welcome to the Was a Matrix Math Exam Guide. My name is Looney, and I'll be assisting you to get all your questions through to us. All you need to do is hit us up on Was a Matrix social media pages and on our WhatsApp line. All the details will be on the screen. We have some cool competitions coming up, so do stay tuned for all the details. Like always, I am never alone. I've got Sia and our sign language interpreter, Keta, with me. So over to you. Hi, guys. Welcome to our exam guide, Paper 1, Mathematics. So everything that I'm going to be saying will be adopted from uh, the diagnostic report and some past papers that we've looked at. So let's just jump right into it. So... As you can see, what the paper looks like is it carries 150 marks. So roughly, if you look at 150 marks, you need to do this in three hours. So what that means is you roughly have one minute or over a minute for each mark that you have. And then there's generally 11 questions in paper one, and then you need to answer all the questions. The other thing is there is an instruction and information page that is available for you. Please, you need to read the instructions and follow them carefully so. You must number all your answers exactly as they are in the question paper. So what this means is if you start with question 5, you can now leave 5.5 .5 and go to question 6 and only do 5.5 .5 after question 6. And then also you need to show your working because remember your marks lie on what you show us in terms of your steps. And then if we just go into great detail now, question one is algebra and some equations, which ranges between 25 plus or minus three marks. And then here you need to be solving quadratic equations. You need to be solving some inequalities for, for us. And then you also need to be doing simultaneous equations. And then you know that that last question that you always run away from, but I believe that you are no longer going to do that. It's some laws of exponents that you need to be trying to solve there. And then our question two and three will be sequence and series. Here we're talking about 25 plus or minus three marks. Here you need to be analyzing different types of sequences and use equations to find a specific term. Also, <clears throat> you need to be calculating the sum of the series. The sum, remember, this is our Sn, and also use some sigma notation. And then lastly, you need to find the sum to infinity. As you know from our information sheet, the formula is given for you. Then question four and five, it's functions and graphs, which ranges between 35 plus or minus three marks you need to be analyzing the graphs of different functions. So here, when I'm talking about analyzing, you need to be talking about things like domain, range. You need to be talking about where the other graph is greater than the other graph. And then also find the missing parameters from a given graph that involves your x-intercepts, your y-intercepts, and, uh, and your turning points. And then also find the point of intersection. Here I'm talking about where the two graphs are intersecting each other. Where they are intersecting each other, we know that the points are going to be the same on each graph. Hence, we equate the graphs. And then also, lastly, you need to apply some transformation uh, to functions. If I say it's translated two units up, three units to the right, you need to be talking about what does that mean. And then if we move on to also question six, we're looking at financial math, which is 15 plus or minus three marks. Here you need to be using the given formula to calculate. Financial math is all about formulas and the language that they are using. The formula involves the future value of an annuity, the installment of a loan. You know that we're talking about a present value when we're mentioning a loan. You need to be finding your interest rate. And please take into consideration the compounding period of your interest rate. And then also the number of terms. You know, when you're talking about annuities, it's normally monthly. If you talk about compound interest, it probably uh, per annum or also monthly or compounded quarterly. And then lastly, you need to look at when it's a depreciation question, you know it's always per annum. 
and then with question seven, we're dealing with differ differential calculus theory, which is between 15 plus minus three marks. Here you need to be finding the first derivative of a function. The very first one, which is a giveaway grade 12s, is uh, from first principles. And then the second one will be to use the short rules. When you're using the short rules, make sure that your x is not a denominator and also your x is not inside a square root. Then lastly, you calculate the gradient of a tangent. You know the gradient of a tangent is actually the first derivative of that particular function. Question eight and nine is differential calculus application. And this is between 20 plus or minus three marks. Here it's mainly maximum and minimum value of a function. As soon as you see minimum and maximum, we know we already go to the first derivative. And then you need to sketch a graph of a cubic function. To sketch a graph, you know you need three things. My x-intercept, my y-intercept, and my turning point. And then lastly, you find the equation of a cubic function. At times, they give you the x-intercept to find this, or they give you the turning point to find that particular equation. Right, guys, I hope that clears a few confusions that you might be having with all of this that we need to be doing in paper one. So right now, let's just go to the last two questions of paper one and just talk about what they exactly they are about. So, if we look at question 10 and 11, it's mainly counting principles and probability. So counting principles, you know, we're talking about um, if I want to arrange a certain word in a specific order, what do I look at? So that's what we are talking about. And we also talk about a factorial. Remember that for me to use a factorial, it means that there is no repetition that is happening there. That's the only time I can use factorial. And then if there is no, if there is repetition, then you don't look at a, a factorial. Also use Venn diagrams and the laws of probability to solve some problems. You know, we have different Venn diagrams where they are not intersecting, where they are intersecting each other, and also where it's just uh, three circles that are intersecting each other. So you need to be talking about what is it that we are doing there, and please prepare in terms of that. And then lastly, determine if events are independent or mutually exclusive. Now, just to talk to you, grade 12s, I hope that clears a few things there. One thing for sure, I believe that you guys can do this, and we believe that you can get everything that you need to get in terms of your marks. One, all of this that I, I just spoke about is from a diagnostic report from last year, and also from looking at a range of past papers. So I'm not saying all of this is what is going to be in the paper, but remember that math is about repetition, and most of the things we look at past papers in order to make sense of what to expect when the question paper is about to be written. So just look at those and prepare wisely and make sure that you drink enough water while you are practicing. Make sure that you exercise regularly. Talk to someone, guys, if you are feeling stressed and always believe in yourself and your confidence. I hope that clears some air in terms of paper one. Back to you now, Luni. Thank you so much, Sia, for all those tips. Guys, we are going to take a very short break, so don't go anywhere. We will see you straight after this. Welcome back from the Ad Break Matrix. If you've just joined us, we are going through your exam guide to assist you in preparing for your upcoming exams. If you are someone who's constantly running out of data, then this next competition is just for you. Wazamatrix brings you hashtag Wazowina competition where two lucky viewers stand a chance to win two gigs of data. So what are you waiting for? 
hop on over to our Facebook page and enter the competition. Well, enough talking from my side. Over to you, Sia. Right. Thanks, Luni, for that. Guys, this segment we're looking at some tips for you to practice for your paper one exam. I know that we all study differently, we have different ways of practicing, but these are just general views of what is it that you need to look at. So these are just gen general tips for everyone to try and adopt them as you are preparing for your paper one. So let's just jump right into it. Now, the very first tip that we are saying here is you need to practice the skills that you have learned in the earlier grades. The very first skill, guys, is factorizing. Now, when you talk about factorizing, you know we have different types of factorizing. It's your difference of two squares. It's factorizing a trinomial. It's factorizing by grouping. And lastly, it's factorizing by taking out a common factor. So you need to please know the differences between these things. Difference of two squares, it's a perfect square minus a perfect square. So that's how you then know that it is a difference of two squares. A trinomial, it's three terms, as tri means three. And the leading term is always your x squared. It might have a coefficient in front. But look at that. Grouping, you take things that have common factors and put them together. But remember, your signs always need to be correct. So you don't take something and leave a minus outside or leave a plus outside. And then the last one, taking out a common factor, if there is something common between two or more terms, you take out that thing that is common and then work it out using division there. And then the second thing is solving equations. When you talk about solving equations, you know. You can solve equations firstly by factorizing or using a quadratic equation. And a quadratic equation is found in your information sheet, which we're still yet going to talk about. Then the last one is graphing. When you talk about graphing, guys, you know that we, when we looked at the first question, we said there's inequalities that you need to do. At times, you need to be able to graph your inequality. You need to be able to graph your functions that you are given and interpret them. So those are just the things that we are trying to bring to your attention. And then also, you need to revise and learn facts about each topic. What this means is you need to make a summary of notes. Guys, math is also a learning subject. I know we always say you need to practice, you need to practice, but there are definitions that you need to know. There are concepts that you need to know and link them to formulas. So please make some notes in terms of summaries of what you understand about a certain concept. The following point will be you need to familiarize yourself with the formula sheet. Now with the formula sheet, guys, I can't stress this enough. The formula sheet needs to be your friend. As soon as you get to the exam, in the exam room, detach the formula sheet and put it on the side. Although you know at the end of the exam you need to leave everything that you found there in the exam room. But just detach it, put it on the side, and work around it so that you don't always need to be going back to the end of the question paper to look at the information sheet. And then in the information sheet, you know, some financial math concepts that are there. If you are solving for a number of terms, you need to be introducing things like your logarithmic functions. So please just have a look at those and try to link them to the correct formula according to the information sheet. You need to also break down the sections into manageable uh, parts. What this means is you trying to study everything all at once will not assist you with anything. You need to make sure that you break them into parts that you can understand. Break them according to links that they have. For example, if you're talking about uh, laws of exponents, exponential functions, and logarithmics, so that's one section on its own. So you group it according to that. That is manageable because it's all talking to exponents. So that's really what I mean and that's just one example. You can break them into sections that you can definitely manage. Then also you need to use colors and highlighters to group some similar ideas together. 
and then you need to also be able to talk to another grade 12 learner about what you understand uh, in terms of each topic or question. Now let's, let's explain this. You know, the more you talk about something, the more you will understand it. Let's just make a typical example. For you to learn a song that you just heard for the first time, you need to listen to it over and over again. And as you're listening to it, you need to be singing along with it. So meaning, as you're singing along to it, that's when it gets in your head and you can then sing the song without it being in the background. Similarly with what we are talking about here, talk to a friend who is in grade 12. If you maybe you don't have any friends, we make sure that the people that you are in the same class with, talk to them, guys. You don't necessarily need to have actual friends. You can just have people that you are studying with or that are in the same class as you and talk to them about ideas that you understand and about questions that you understand. And then also, I know that this is something that most of our teachers tell us, to use past papers. Past papers, the whole point of using past papers is to apply what you have learned. So it's not necessarily to say you're just going through questions and you don't know what you're looking at. You are applying everything that you have learned into the past papers because exactly that's where you're going to need to apply it. So please make sure that you do a lot of past papers. And when you're doing past papers, you don't need to do from question one up until question 12, no. You can just do question one and two of all the question papers, understand it, go to question three and four of all the question papers, understand it, five and six, like that, until you are okay, you are okay with your understanding for the exam. And then the other thing that you need to also look at here will be you need to plan how you are going to answer the question paper in order to boost your confidence. What does that mean? You can start with the topics that you find easy. Now let me just give everybody some tips here. You know there's some reading time in the exam. That 10 minutes, you need to go through the whole question paper, look at questions that you find easy by looking at them. And those are the questions that you're gonna start with. And then go on to questions that you are not so sure about and try them out. And then lastly, end with questions that maybe you think you find difficult. And what that will do is it will make sure that your three hours is used wisely because by the time you get to the questions that you find a bit difficult, maybe you will be left with an hour because if you're doing easy questions, it means you're just going to be sailing through those questions because you understand them. So please make sure that you plan your time and form a scheme in terms of how you're going to answer those questions. All right, guys, so those are the tips for you and what you need to try and do in order to prepare for paper one. So now let's look at a question in specific that surprisingly, last year's grade 12s actually found to be problematic according to the diagnostic report. So let's just have a look at that question. So the concept is from number patterns and uh, sequences. So here, the a few notes for you to please make sure that you know. You need to recognize the difference between a sequence and a series. So a sequence, you know, we normally use our semicolons because it's a term after the other. And with a series, we are normally adding the terms together. So that's what I want you to please look at. And then lastly, you also need to know how to identify the sequence and the series that are there. So you know with an arithmetic, we are talking about the common difference which is showed by D. With a geometric, we're talking about a common ratio there which is R. And then with a quadratic, we are talking about two differences where one of the difference forms an arithmetic sequence. Now in specific, let's look at a question that we actually found that was in sigma notation. Now the question said evaluate. Now, let's just talk about this first before we actually do it. Guys, when a question says evaluate, it means you need to look at what concept is it. So here they're saying we must evaluate a sigma of something. What that means is you need to add because that's what sigma means. So here you will need to first expand 
the, the, the sequence that we have. And you can already see the sequence is n squared plus 1, which makes it a quadratic pattern. There is no straight formula to find the sum of quadratic patterns, so you will need to uh, expand all the terms and add them manually, please. So that's the main thing that you need to please note here. So let's just do the question together. So here, I'm just going to go to the next slide. All right. Now here on the next slide, for you to expand this, the n is equal to 3, means that the first term is at t is at n is equal to 3, making it 3 squared. Okay, let me just erase that. Making this 3 squared plus 1, and then the first term will be um, 4 squared plus 1. The third term will be 5 squared plus 1. I'm just uh, stating them or expanding them going down so that there's enough space and then the following one will be 6 squared plus 1 and then 7 squared plus 1 and then lastly it will be 8 squared plus 1. So what this means is the very first one that I have there will be 4 plus the second one there will be 16 uh, oh so my bad not, not 4 Instead, it is going to be 9 plus 1, which is 10. The following one will be 4 squared, which is 16 plus 1. That's 17. Plus, the next one will be 26 plus 37 plus um, 50 plus 65. And then you will just need to use your calculator to add this. So what am I trying to say here? This is a quadratic pattern. Quadratic pattern means you need to expand the pattern, right? Because there is no straight formula to find the actual sequence. So you expand number one. Number two, you add them manually. And then lastly, you write down what the answer is. So you can just use your calculator to add uh, the values that are on the board and find your answer. So that's it from me. We're going to go to an ad break. But before that, let's just go back to Looney and I will see you guys after. Thank you so much, Sia, and thank you, Keta. Guys, we are going to take a break, but before we do, don't forget to hit us up on Facebook, Was A Matrix, as well as on our WhatsApp line. Send us through your questions. Talk to us. How are you preparing for the exams? How are you feeling? Just let us know, and we'll communicate on the socials. So let's take a quick break, and we'll see you straight after this. <music> Welcome back from the break, Matrix. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are still assisting you with your exam guide. Now we've got a question from one of our learners from WhatsApp, so we're gonna head straight to that and assist you. Hi, Looney. What is the difference between mutually exclusive events and independent events? All right, so that's a very great question, guys that we have to do. So let's just have a look at it. But just to start, we're talking about mutually exclusive events and independent events. So there is some connection between the two because they are both events, but they differ a lot. And I will just show you now how they differ from one another. So the very first one that we're going to talk about is mutually exclusive events. When you say events are mutually exclusive events, meaning it's events that cannot happen simultaneously, right? So these events cannot happen at the same time, which, would, which is the same as simultaneously. And one of the examples that I can use here is if I'm flipping a coin, there is no way that I'm going to get a head and a tail at the same time. So I'm either going to get first a head and then get a tail after that. So that's what mutually exclusive events actually means. So what this means is the intersection of the two events does not exist, it's actually equal to zero. And there is a formula for that, which I'm just gonna give you now. And the formula is, if I say the probability 
of A or B, right? This will be equals to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, right? But where the probability of A and B is equals to zero, and B is equals to zero. So that's what we really mean here when we talk about mutually exclusive events. And then, you know, some representations of this, if I want to draw a Venn diagram, I will draw two separate circles to indicate that the events are mutually exclusive from one another. And then the other question that we just need to look at is independent events. These events are events that can happen at the same time. So, for example, if I'm flipping a coin and throwing a die, there's a possibility of me getting a head and a six at the same time because those events are independent of each other. Getting a six does not affect getting a head or a tail and vice versa. So that's what independent events actually means. And then we also have a formula for this that we show uh, independent events with. And the formula would be the probability of A and B will actually be equals to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Now, you saw that with the first question, we actually used an or, right? The reason for an or is because it's either this or that. That's what mutually exclusive events actually means. But with independent events, we are saying and because it's me getting a head and getting a, a six in terms of throwing a die. So that's why the formula here is an and, and with mutually exclusive, it's an or. So let's look at a, an actual question and try and answer it in order to make a point of what the difference is between these two concepts. All right, so the question is, Events A and B are independent to one another. So probability of A is equals to that and the probability of B is equals to that. Now the fact that these two events are independent, it means immediately we know that there is an intersection between the two events. And then the first question says we must draw a Venn diagram to represent the information that is given and then indicate the probabilities of each region. Now, if you draw the, probab uh, the, the Venn diagram of this, this is how it will look like. And then here by A, they told us the probability of A was 0, 0,4, and they gave us the probability of B. Now, the first thing we need to do is to find what the probability of A and B is. So we need to know what the probability of A and B is in order to show the intersection there. And we did say that this is found by multiplying the probability of A with the probability of B. So this will actually be 0, 0,4 multiplied by 0, 0,25. So that's what the probability of um, A and B will be, and this is actually 0, 0,1. Therefore, it means here by the intersection here, I'm dealing with 0, 0,1, and then the probability of A will be 0, 0,4 minus 0, 0,1, making it, so I'm just going to write it here because I'm using blue and it's blue. This is 0, 0,3, and then with red here, which is the probability of B, it will be 0, 0,25 minus 0, 0,1, which will actually be 0, 0,1. Five like that. So that's how you will then draw your Venn diagram there. And then the following question wanted us to find the probability of A or not B. Now, let's understand first what this means. If I say to you the probability of not B, I'm actually saying 1 minus the probability of B. That's what the probability of not B means. So from having the probability of B, what is the complementary to it? Because the total probability is one. Therefore, this will actually be, um, let me just go to the next slide and show you here. All right, so this is what I have, right? So the probability of 
not b, which will be the first thing that we need to find, will be equals to 1 minus the probability of b, and this is 1 minus 0, 0,25, and this will actually be 0, 0,75. And then the probability of A is already given to us. So the probability of A or not B will be equal to, remember, all means you are adding the probability of A plus the probability of not B. And then we are minusing the probability of A and not B. B. And therefore, this will be equal to, which I'm going to leave to you to do the calculation here. The probability of A, we know, is 0, 0,4 plus the probability of not B is 0, 0,75, then minus the two probabilities there. Remember, if it's an end you are multiplying, it will be 0, 0,4 four multiply by 0, 0,75 and then you can then calculate this. So the big concept here is probability of not B. That's the bigger concept that we are talking about, meaning it will be 1 minus the probability of what B is. And then also the other big concept was these two events are independent to each other, meaning the probability of A and B is equals to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So guys, I hope that clears a lot of things, especially with probability, because I know that you guys jump this section when you get to it. But hopefully by now you will definitely do this. So let's just have a look at the other things here. So here I have um, a don't forget to. Please don't forget to post your questions on our social media pages. If you have any questions, really there is no hope for you if you don't post them. And we won't be able to assist you if you don't post them to us. So please don't forget to post them on our social media platforms. That be it WhatsApp or our Facebook page. So please utilize those platforms. Also, go, be go to bed early the night before your maths exam. I don't understand people that want to study until... 12 a.m. when they are writing at 9 a.m. the following day. Please make sure you get enough sleep so that you don't uh, get exhausted in the exam and you can concentrate for the three hours. And also, make sure you eat some breakfast before you go write your exam. Don't forget to exercise while studying. And also, the last point here is talk to someone if you are feeling stressed. Exercise is the biggest thing here, guys. You need to keep your blood running. You need to keep your body active while you are trying to study. So if you are taking a 10-minute break, just run around the house or run around the yard or just do 10 push-ups and then go back to a study. Also make sure that you eat some breakfast in the morning. Should you be stressed, talk to a friend. Remember when we started, I said it does not have to be somebody that's really, really your friend. It can be people that you are in the same class with, because some of us have friends that are not maybe in the same grade with us, but it can be somebody that you are just doing meds with. Talk to them, explain what you are stressed about, and then hopefully they will definitely help you understand something better. Guys, that's all from me. I hope that's cleared some confusion in terms of your preparation. This is exactly what you might want to expect in the exam paper because it comes from the diagnostic report and also from past papers that we looked at to try and analyze for you. So that's it from me. I will see you guys. Back to you, Luni. Thank you so much, Sia. Matrix, you've been awesome today. Thank you for tuning in and a big congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on the Wazimatrix Facebook page after the show. We will be back with more revision on your number one educational channel, so please check out our schedule on www.wazimatrix.co.za. Well then, from me, Looney, Sia, and our sign language interpreter, Keta, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>